Wow, it seems to be getting a lot of people on here more than I expected. That's great. Cool. <laughs> so um, I'll just, I'll sort of start. Um, I'm Maria McClellan. I'm a student at the University of Hawaii, Manoa campus uh, in the Ethnic Studies department as my major. And um, somehow, I don't understand how, I became the president of the Ethnic Studies Student Association. Uh, just tell, ask Ruben how, because he just named it to me. There was no voting consent on this, so sorry if I'm misrepresenting the group. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, so if you probably seen me on campus, um, especially with my dog Shadow. Shadow, come here, look. Everybody knows you. Come say hi. There's Shadow. Hi, Shadow. Hi, Shadow. Everybody is close on campus, so if she, she doesn't understand screens, so she's not going to know who, what you guys are doing. Um, so there's, I wanted to put together a series of events, which kind of got halted a little bit because of this pandemic. Um, well, we, what I wanted to do was to bring sort of disability awareness and the fact that we're just like everybody else in this world. Um, we have, yes, we may look different. Yeah, we may act different. Yeah, we may you know, just be like you or just be like others. So I wanted, the reason why it's called nor, normal, no, normalizing differences is because I want our differences to be expressed in, in a positive way and to see that it is normal because everybody in this world has a difference, whether or not you identify as a person with a disability, a minority, whether your skin color is a little different than the ideal skin color of your community, or whether you're a different height, or whether you are obsessed with baseball cars and someone else is like, I don't like that. You know, they prefer, I don't know, Legos. You can consider that a disability if you want. I mean, you might not in the medical world, but you can among your friends. So I brought on, um, a few of other friends of mine um, who are in the same little people community, but we have very different ideals on this world and the way we interact within our own physical community of where we live. And um, I think we're all activists in some way, shape or form. So I'm gonna let them introduce themselves to decide what's important to them to tell everybody yeah. Also, the other things I wanted to let you know is this is being recorded. So if you don't ever want someone to see you, just turn your camera off. Um, at the bottom of the screen, this entire event is being closed captioned real time. Um, there's a button that says closed caption. You just got to enable it. We also have two sign language interpreters, um, which you'll find somewhere in the sea of videos. I apologize, I don't really know how to make their video more common than others. And this is going to be sort of informal. So this is going to be a conversation mostly. And we'll figure it out from there. So, um, Leah, Joe, and Ian, do you, one of you guys want to start? Um, like who you are and what you bring to the table sort of on your what your jobs are, what you do, I don't know, anything. Oh, okay. Um, my name is uh, Joe Stramondo, and um, I live uh, in San Diego, um, where I teach at San Diego State University. Um, my uh, particular uh, area is philosophy of disability and bioethics. Um, and so I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, disability and how it um, intersects with um, the medical professions in various ways. Um, so I think that pretty much sums it up. So I'm Leah. Um, as a side note, Joe and I are married and have two kids. Um, but I am currently a project coordinator for the Center for Dignity and Healthcare for People with Disabilities. So we are also looking at how, um, how people with disabilities are impacted in healthcare settings. Um, and 
so yeah that's what I do for my most of my daytime job and then um, I've also done all kinds of other activist stuff I've um, every summer I work for um, or I co-facilitate a girls camp for girls with disabilities um, and then I what else have I done I've managed an anti-suicide campaign for um, people with disabilities. I was the director of public relations for LPA. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of different things. Chapter president. Oh shoot, chapter president of LPA, of the San Diego chapter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, sorry, am I am I audible right now? Cool. Uh, so I had initially planned to do this intro in an ASL, but uh, given the the casual vibe we're going for here. I'm, I gotta stick to spoken English. Um, but I want to notice that we, you know, we're, we're in a space that is very culturally English dominant um, by virtue of being academia in the U.S. And, and that's not something that happened by accident, right? That's, that's decades and centuries of history behind it. Um, but I'm here as a bilingual deaf person. I think I'm the only signer on this call, uh, aside from the interpreters. Um, and one of our hosts tonight is the Ethnic Studies Association at the University of Hawaii. So we, while we're all here speaking English, we also have, you know, this, this long history behind us of a variety of, of linguistic and cultural backgrounds. And I think that, you know, as we're discussing normalizing disability, as we're discussing how we construct normal, it's important to remember that we have not just a single community that we're all representing here, but we have a variety of communities that are uh, you know, different disability spaces that are non-disability parts of our identity that all come together to construct what we assume to be uh, a normal. Uh, sorry, and I, I guess a little bit about my background since since that's what we're doing here. Uh, I work in tech. My my day job is not disability focused. Um, I have I started a nonprofit three or four years ago that does work on uh, diversity and inclusion at tech conferences. Um, and I've done um, activism on a, a variety of fronts in the disability community, most recently around transit and housing in the Bay Area. So uh, as you can see from those little introduction, um, all of us have done some other different path, not just the exact same um, activism work or ideals or goals. So uh, throughout this whole thing, I want people to know that they can ask questions. Um, they can put it in the chat or they can just interrupt and speak. Um, so uh, I just want to talk a little bit about what, well, I'll talk a little bit on my own self, what I've done in terms of activacy, because I don't think I've really explained that part. Um, so as a person with um, Wernicke syndrome, which is rare, and a lot of people haven't heard of it, although I think most people on this call have met me in one shape or form, so they know. Um, and so in this subcategory of little people with Wernicke, there really wasn't much of a community uh, formulated, and I... I was rather kind of annoyed by the lack of more activism in this world um, because, you know, there's so much medical research that's focused on cures, that focus on what appointments you need to go to, how do you survive, how do you live, but there was nothing about, like, your day-to-day -day life, your social well-being, your, you know, and what do we want from the scientists? So. Um, I started a conference um, and in Delaware because why in Delaware and not here and why the opposite end of the country is because that's literally the only place a lot of us could have surgery and also research was being done there. So it was also cheaper for us to host it there. And so by doing that, our voices as individual patients with more guilt have gotten louder in the scientific minds. And we have literally changed the research methods. So they discovered things they've never understood about Morikyo because I gathered, and I say I because the first year it was me really, 
um, going on social media, getting everybody in the world, like, hey, show up. Surprisingly, 30 people with more just showed up. Unheard of. Before, I think the most was seven or eight. And so now uh, we get, I, I just started trying to form a nonprofit, which hasn't been approved yet, but what we're trying to do is say, you know, this, this conference is not just medical. I made sure, you know, other families can speak and an eight year old wanted to speak. And I was like, yes, come speak. It's not a perfect polished talk. And guess what? That didn't matter. And it forced the scientists to sit there and see their patients with a whole different eye and realize, oh, this kid is really in to dancing. He's got dance moves because we hired a DJ if the Namorica community who DJ in the evening dances and doctors showed up with their kids or families. So I'm really huge on this whole community thing. And I think in Hawaii, I, it's, our disability community is kind of lacking a bit in that whole community sense. So what I want to do is try to bring us together and let us shine in our communities. Let us be out there. Don't just be like, hey, good for you. You're out there shopping. Everybody else in the world does that. Good for you. You got a dog. Well, I have a service dog because I need it. I'm not lucky because I have a service dog or lucky that I have a wheelchair. Or lucky that I have hearing aids because I can't hear that well. Um, so these are the things that I, I, that's why I started this conference. And that's kind of why I started this within the ethnic studies department, even though there isn't a huge emphasis on disabilities within the department. I'm sure all my professors can say I'm that annoying student that raises hands and they'll go, well, what about this? In the deaf community, there's this. In the wheelchair community, you know, and I think I bring an interesting conversation sometimes. I don't know. I might be annoying other students, but I don't care. Uh, <laughs> I just want everybody to feel welcome in one shape or form. So I kind of was wondering from like Joe, like you're in the academic field. You teach a lot. Like how do students respond to you being their professor and how does that, um, mm -hmm. yeah, how does that, in, in, how do you interact with that field? Yeah, yeah. So, um, the, uh, I have a funny story about the first, um, course I, I ever uh, was the sort of the, the instructor for um, was when I was in graduate school and um, I didn't have the experience to sort of know uh, beforehand that I needed to watch out for this particular issue and so it, uh, it surprised me as much as it surprised them. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I showed up to teach my course and uh, on the first day and it was in a lecture hall where, you know, you could go in through the back and then there was a, a flight of steps down to the front where there was the, the little podium and whiteboard and everything where you would uh, position yourself to teach, but there was no ramp or anywhere to get down to the, uh, the front of the classroom. Um, because- Wait, everyone should know you use a power wheelchair. Oh yeah, I use a power wheelchair, sorry. Yeah. That's uh, a relevant bit of information, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So uh, there was, uh, you know, this this assumption that's baked into our built environment that uh, positions of authority are for non-disabled people, um, and so of course there was, uh, you know, accessible seating for students that might use a wheelchair um, in the back of the room, um, but there was no way for an a wheelchair using instructor to access the appropriate uh, space. And so I thought that was that was telling. Um, and so I conducted a little bit of a, I'm a philosopher, but I conducted a, a, a social science experiment, right? Um, Leah will tell you that I don't do real research. Anyway, um, so I, uh, I um, parked myself at the back of the room in the, the student seating uh, for wheelchair users. And I just sort of waited for everyone to come in and, and sit down. And everybody was just sort of looking around, waiting for the, the professor to show up. And then I just started talking. 
um, and everybody was like whipping around in their chair looking at me, and so it was, it was kind of funny. Um, so I taught the, the class that day from the back of the room and sort of uh, flipped the classroom, as they like to say. <laughs> um, so that was, that was the only time I did that. Of course, I got the classroom changed after that uh, first uh, meeting. Um, but I think that it's, um, to, answer your, to answer your question, I think that it's, it's an uphill battle because uh, even, the, even the built environment is stacked against us, right? Talking about normalizing disability, there's all of the, the social attitudes and biases and so on and so forth um, that a lot of times can sort of remain hidden that, uh, you know, people aren't going to sort of say to you, oh, you know, I don't think you have, uh, you know, uh, authority because you are three feet tall and use a chair or something, right? They're not going to be that obvious about it. Um, but you can see it just in the social space that we, that we occupy. Um, and so I think, does that, does that kind of answer your question, Maria? Yeah, I, I don't even remember what my question really was. I think there's an interesting... Like how are people respond to him being a professor? I think there's an interesting meta point here as well, Joe. Um, when you started this story, the hinge was very much on you being a power chair user. Leah had to remind you to tell the audience, right? And this is something that I noticed when... So my, my company is all remote these days, uh, and, and that started at around the same time that that shelter in place did but but it is a permanent change for us we are deliberately remote uh, but around the time that we all started hanging out on zoom a lot more i realized that people who hadn't met me before stopped reading me as disabled um in ways that they do when we meet in person and i actually found this a little bit upsetting this is it's very confusing to me it seems very obvious to me that, that my body is not like like the the normative body and all of a sudden this is gone um but i'm very used to that with with deafness i i my speech is my speech does not have an obvious deaf accent i'm very used to passing for hearing and having to sort of perform deafness as a way of, of expressing this is who i am and this is how we have to engage but i'm not used to having to do that with the fact that i'm also a power chair user with the fact that i am three feet tall this is this is a very weird change for me personally yeah i have the same uh you know sort of thing because you know my arms are short so i'm sitting close to the screen so my head actually looks huge whereas i noticed everybody else has this nice big background i'm like why is it back there i can't hear and i can't control my computer and it's it's very interesting because also now People don't even ask like about the service lab. Can I get the service lab? Now it's backlight on me again. And it's no longer about you're really small. You're in a wheelchair. And and not only that, all these services around the world are all of a sudden online. Like I get like front row seats to the nice playing DJ on Instagram. I'm like, come on, you don't get that in real life. Like, <laughs> I mean you do if you're willing to shell out money and you know try to figure out if that venue is accessible and so this pandemic is really changing that and it's also changing what do I need in the classroom setting like I always have a note taker now nobody can see the note taker even though he's on all the classes and there's no longer who is that weird kiddo sitting back there that never speaks and I think that's really kind of powerful but I also really do miss being out and about in public, but there's got to be some sort of what's going on now in some ways is helping people with disabilities come to light. And I feel like it needs to be brought into the physical setting. I don't know if I'm making sense, but yeah. That's... To go off of what you were saying, Ian, uh, I think that it reminds me of something a first timer said to me after going to their first national convention. I was, and they said, you know, I have, people, for yeah. little people of America, sorry, uh, was, I know how to be a little person the rest of the year, but suddenly I'm not a little person here. Like, I don't, I don't know who I'm supposed to be. And like, if you take that first uh, layer off, it kind of reminded me what you were saying. Yeah. For sure. 
Yeah, I got scared the first time I went to LPA. I have to admit, I almost no, passed away. What are you talking about? <laughs> the first it's, time I went to very, Seattle. It's very, it's very, you know what to do when you're the weirdo, when you're the, the oddball on the room. And then you walk into the room and you're like, oh, I assume these people have something in common with me, but but I don't actually know how that works. I don't. I I haven't constructed this part of who I am yet. Right. <laughs> yeah. That that uh, the because a lot of people here aren't part of Little People America. I'll explain it. Um, is a week about a week long uh, conference convention that usually takes place around early July. And every evening there is a party. Um, during the day, there are a lot of fun different activities. There are also some free medical consultations. And we literally take over the hotel. I mean, the entire hotel staff, suddenly the, all their clientele are, you know, short and running around on all different kinds of equipment. It's kind of crazy to, to, to witness the first time. I mean, the first time I went, I was like, I was frightened. And now I just love it and it's like my home. Um, but we actually now take over four major hotels sometimes. I mean, it's huge. I think and the last one was, was it two or 3,000 that we hit at the last national conference? Yeah. It, was, it was some very impressive number, I thought. I think what's interesting about this conversation is um, to do a bit of a bit of philosophy, geek out on you a little bit. Um, a, a lot of our a lot of our everyday behaviors are scripted in a way, right? Where we have certain um, I don't know, just certain habits that we have and certain things that we do, where we just sort of go through life um, according to what other people expect of us and what we expect of other people according to a kind of script, right? Uh, you know, when you, I don't know, go into an elevator, you talk about the weather, right? Um, just sort of, you, you follow the script in life. And, and I think that there is sort of a, a certain kind of script that disabled people follow. Um, and, and, you know, you can tinker with it and try to, uh, you know, make it your own in different ways. Um, but sometimes it's, it's kind of forced upon you too in, in various ways, just sort of by how others interact with you. And the, the interesting thing about entering a space where other people are like you and that you're in a dominant rather than a uh, sort of subordinate kind of position um, where you're, in the, you're suddenly in the majority is that the script sort of flies out the window, right? And so it's, that's, I think that's kind of what's so scary about it is that you don't, you don't know how to act. It's like, okay, you know, I, I've been, you know, following this way of moving through the world my entire life and then all of a sudden I'm here and I have this weight of this responsibility to figure out, okay, now how do I write my own script? What do I, what do, I do now, right? Um, at least that was sort of how I experienced it. I, I kind of went to LPA um, when I was um, a little bit older than, than some folks as far as my, my first sort of national um, where I experienced that shock. I was in my early 20s and uh, it was just sort of like, okay, you know, I, I know how to be uh, Joe, the, the college kid, and I know, you know, who has, you know, dwarfism and uses a power chair and so on and so forth, but I, I don't know what that means here. I think there's, yes, and I think there's also, you're entering, it's not that you're losing all scripts, you're entering a place that has a script and expectations and norms and a culture, um, and L LPA, I see a lot of this, but I, I, I've, ex I've seen it elsewhere, right? You one very common experience for students at Gallaudet University in DC, um, to some extent this is my experience, is you've grown up mainstream. You may or may not have signed growing up, you may have learned it later in life, and all of a sudden you're entering a community that has cultural norms and cultural practices and a script and how they relate to each other, and you didn't get that growing up. And so, and, and even if, even if many of the people around you have that same experience, they've already done that. So you're entering this space where it feels like everybody knows the dance except for you. And that's a, that's a very hard thing for people to, to figure out for the first time in a lot of our communities. And also to learn about the hierarchy within LPA that happens um, and how things 
you know, where you fit within the hierarchy is, I think is really interesting. Um, a lot of um, bullshit, if I can say so myself. <laughs> I think, I think as the, as the token acorn in the room, you get to say all the things you want about acorns. <laughs> It comes really in the roost. I, you uh, know, as an acorn, I didn't really, um, I don't think I fully realized the acorn hierarchy until I started dating Joel. And I was amazed at the number of acorns that came up to me and said, we don't date non acorns. <laughs> like, I missed that rule somewhere. And they, like, they needed to fill me in on that. And I was like, well, we can. It's okay. <laughs> we should we should probably give background for the non LPs. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so, in addition to being a rapper, uh, an acon is uh, a form of dwarfism. As a type. Um, so we're... Yeah, it's a diagnosis. Uh, achondroplasia, and uh, they are the the most common uh, form of dwarfism, and so they are in the majority in uh, Little People of America, our, our organization that we are, are talking about here. Um, and so uh, they they tend to have a lot of the the social power within the organization and set the rules and and uh, tell set the, the steps of the set the steps of the dance as, as Ian uh, was sort of uh, alluding to there. That's a nice metaphor. Let's hear from other people. Other thoughts, comments. Yeah, and Ian, when I was want to just right, you know, just start talking, ask questions. Uh, Talk about your experience. I mean, if it's the first time you met somebody, to what you anything, just open up. I um I always find it interesting too that um, dwarfism is really defined by LPA. So there really isn't actually a medical definition of dwarfism. There's a medical definition of short stature. There's a medical definition of skeletal dysplasia. Achondroplasia is actually not the most common of either of those, but. Um, LPA's definition of dwarfism is, is kind of what, what sets the standard and what sets the culture. So there's just, you know, kind of all of this interplay. My form of dwarfism, the height ranges from three feet to five feet. Um, I'm four foot six. Um, and so there are a lot of people, you know, with my same condition, same surgeries, um, same diagnosis who are tall enough that they're not welcome at LPA. So just interesting, interesting dynamics of just kind of how, you know, how the culture is defined and how I think people who have been excluded then go on to exclude just to kind of create a, a safer space. Jerry and I, when we were on the board, we looked at um, changing the definition to include a broader um, definition to or broader membership base. Um, and ooh, that brought fire. <laughs> um, yeah, like it was a very heated uh, discussion to have and to even just, let's just think about it. What would this look like? And mm -hmm. yeah. And let's not, let's not forget, we have a, we have a, a height-based metric within LPA for membership, but there are, there are a lot of, of diagnostic groups that absolutely fall within that category. But don't but don't show up. Don't think of themselves like this is not a community that they have ever considered that might be available to them, um, which is fine, right? Like people people find community where they find it. Um, but it's certainly like we have this formal definition of is it four ten or four eleven or whatever that that numeric threshold is, and that doesn't actually accurately reflect who comes and who is interested and who who is going to show up in this space and suddenly be the, be the, the person who's looking different. And I think that's, a, that's an interesting cultural marker as well, that we've, we've got this construction of dwarfism in the U.S. that is, is not just limited to the things that we have expressed as our definition of dwarfism. Yeah, somebody just asked in the chat um, if there's a difference between being little and other places you've lived or visited compared to Hawaii. Um, and I have to say, definitely there is. I mean, I was born in New York City, right in Manhattan, uh, and I went to high school in Vermont, and I went, I lived in Ohio for like half a year at a terrible, terrible school, and then I came here to Hawaii. And um, I have to say the difference of reactions is a huge difference, because in New York City, where I lived, 
people would stare at me. They would question me out loud. What did you do in your past life? Who are you? How are you out here by yourself? People would follow me and they want to follow me home because they think I'm some kid who, um, I don't know, ran away from home, got lost. And then in Vermont, there weren't any really little people because it's so rural there. Uh, everybody in that town actually knew my entire family because my family settled there like 14 generations back. So that I can't really compare what it's like there. But here in Hawaii, nobody, I mean, I've only gotten one or two stairs here. I don't get stairs every day. No one has tried to take my picture. Uh, and I feel more included or I'm, a, I'm more allowed or accepted to be out in public. But also I have to say I'm in a power wheelchair and it's not wheelchair accessible, but in terms of the social interaction, is so much better and that's why I plan to stay here for life because I don't feel stigmatized going out my door. Um, I, you guys lived, I mean Ian and Joe and Leah, you've all lived in different states. Have you noticed it being different? I mean you've lived here. I don't know if you guys ever been to Hawaii either. But. I haven't been to Hawaii. I was just gonna add I think there's a, I mean Joe and I talk about this all the time. There's a huge difference of the stigma around a wheelchair and a stigma and the stigma around not being in a wheelchair but being a little person. Um, so often all people see is Joe's wheelchair and there's um, there's kind of a cultural norm that's like you're supposed to accept wheelchairs, you're supposed to be helpful, or you're supposed to whereas um, I feel like that culture there's a different conversation that's had around being a little person I don't know if that makes sense, but I feel like yeah. there's a total different different forms of stigma. Right, right. Right. Both both are very stigmatized, but it's just the way the stigma looks is different. And that, you know, with with um the wheelchair, a lot of times you get the reaction of pity. Um, whereas uh someone that walks that is a little person, uh oftentimes Leah hasn't been on the receiving end of pity as much. Right. Um, but has been instead sort of on the receiving end of like mockery and ridicule and that kind of thing. Um, so I think that's that's kind of the biggest difference that, that we've seen has been, you know, it hasn't really been. I feel, so I, I think in addition to that, there's there's a, a big difference in who gets photographed. Um, and some of that is around the equipment you have and the shape of your body. But a lot of that I think is also gendered. Uh, and and it's it's, I'm not saying I've never been photographed in public, but it certainly seems that I experience a lot less of that than people I talk to who are women, who are sort of classically recognized LP bodies, whereas mine is, is you know, the, the power chair overrides, like Joe and Leah said. And so I think that the, the ways that these stigmas manifest is very different depending on, on the mythologies that exist around the body. Yeah, it's, um, it's, this little bit kind of reminded me of um, in one of my ethnic studies classes, it was talking about how are you, uh, are you treated different based on your background, your race, your color, your skin. And I was like, I have no idea how to differentiate being someone who's part Japanese, part Italian, part English. And in Hawaii, it's a huge deal if you're from the mainland. So being a mainlander who just moved here six or so years ago versus being a little person versus being female versus being in a wheelchair. And it was almost insulting to me because this professor was like, well, you need to like figure out who you are. And I said, I know who I am. You're just asking me to write a paper that there's no way I can make it just about that. So that's why I had to add in all these other layers because I mean, you can say, oh, I'm white, but I don't feel like I'm white because I don't have that white privilege that people talk so highly of. And so that's, that's one of the three things of why I kind of think this, these conversations are really beneficial. And I try to bring these up in classes because I think everybody needs to understand that you can't always differentiate why you might be consider different, strange, whatever, in someone else's eye when you've just been on the receiving end of all of it. And so I think that's important. 
I think there's a there's a related thread here of the the tools we use to understand ourselves and our experiences being very much shared. Um, I want to say this was my first semester of college, uh, but certainly freshman year I took a course in women's and gender studies, uh, kind of by accident, and ended up being one of the more important courses I've taken as an undergrad, uh, because it gave me a box of tools, not just for talking about gender, but for saying, oh, this is, this is how social power works. This is how people exist within social categorization. This is, like, these are things that are interesting, not just really in that box of gender, but in that box of uh, queerness, in that box of disability, in that box of, like, of all of these various manifestations of people being different from each other, all comes back to shared sets of tools. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, we, 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 we talk, I think, the, the four of us about disability studies, and that's, that's fantastic. There's certainly work unique to that field, but we borrow a lot from other fields in understanding ourselves, and we, I hope we share a lot of these things back uh, with those fields that don't directly apply to us. Yeah, Igran, you had a your hand raised. Do you want to speak? Me? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, going back a bit to the conference we were talking about, and it reminded me of some of the, in our organization, I don't know if anyone else in their orgs can relate to this, but we have a lot of, the political power is actually in the hands of not little people, not the people with our conditions, but the parents of little people who are not themselves disabled, but they have children who are little people and we have struggles sometimes between, uh, it's kind of becomes factionalized between uh, non, -dis non little people, parents of little people have positions in the org and have political power, have votes, their members, just like us, us, you know, but they have different points of view about what we, what to do or what we want to do with our, with our org and with our, with our body and our bodies, I guess you could say. And I know Leah has, has talked about this, we've all talked about this. And I wanted to know if anyone had, uh, would like to share about that. About, I mean, and I think there's a, in other orgs, like the autistic groups and so on, there's a struggle between like the, the parents versus the people, the children who have um, the situation and different points of view about uh, what to do about it and so on. So um, that's kind of my question for the group. I think what's interesting about LPA um, is that you see that divide in other disability groups for sure. You see that divide in the autistic community, like you said, you see it in the deaf uh, community and deaf culture. Um, but what's interesting about LPA I think is that we have an organization that includes both usually you have sort of separate structures and separate institutions. Um, you know, you have Autism Speaks that's controlled by uh, parents and medical folks. And then you have the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network that's controlled by autistic adults, right? Um, and, you know, the same thing goes with, uh, with other diagnosis uh, organizations and so on. Um, LPA is one of the very few that I can think of that is uh, tries to be a big tent and include uh, both of these groups within one institutional structure. And so I think that's why we get uh, so much friction within the organization um, because for other, for other disabilities, the friction happens between organizations. I don't know if that makes sense to what you're, what you're saying, Eugene. Um, and it's, for me, that's really tricky because part of me wants to be a purist, right? And be like, who cares what those average height people think? Like, you know, let's take LPA back. Let's, you know, let's make it ours. Let's, you know, uh, you know, a whole, take all the power back and, you know, raise our fist in the air and so on and so forth. And that's a, that's a big part of me, if you want to be honest. Um, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of value in uh, having uh, you know, a, a, an organization that includes both parents of LPs and LP adults, um, it, it, just because 
uh, you know, the parents are parents of someone. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, having the ability to um, build relationships with uh, children who are LPs, um, you know, from their, their, their very young age, I think is, is really beneficial. And I'm not sure that we would have that kind of capacity if, if we were a completely dwarf controlled organization. I don't know if that makes sense. I think it's really like just attention of like, who knows, whose experience is better, knows more. And I, I mean, I think now that I'm a mom, I kind of am starting to get it. And that like, the parents are like, no, like I have the best interest for my child, right? Like that's your parent role. And the LP adults are like, no, 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 you don't anymore. Mm -hmm. So there's like this, just to give a little background, I think this like tension of, and I think um, it seems like more recently that tension has really built up as to, okay, so who's, who's making the decisions? Who really knows more? And it's like, well, maybe it's just two different perspectives. I think you've, you've forgotten mentions. We're not all LP members on this call. We, we should mention the additional friction uh, between parents who are themselves LPs and parents who are average statured, where you, you have this additional conflict of LP parents saying, no, I understand your child's experience because that was my experience. And you have the average statured parent saying, yes, but you've never been an average statured parent. And these are, these are both perspectives with some merit, but they are definitely a source of, of tension and friction. Yeah, I was wondering, um, well, the, the recently I read a, a paper by Joe about being a parent as a uh, disabled person. And I'm wondering sort of from Leah and Joe, like now that you guys are parents, has this issue sort of changed? And are you, are you, I'm assuming your kids are average height, but I don't know that. So like, are you all of a sudden being like, I know it's best because you guys are average, right? Are you like, well, I'm little, I don't know how to navigate this? Or it's, uh, it kind of reminded me of the book, actually you guys were in that movie, Far From the Tree, where every parent wants their kid to be a mirrored image of who they are and they don't want to be different. So I'm just wondering, like, since mm -hmm. you guys have that unique experience of that, I just wonder, like, can you speak on that a little bit? Yeah, I was, first I'll say, yes, both of our kids are average size, and um, I've been surprised at the number of people that have said to us, oh, we're surprised that you're still involved in LPA since you have average size kids, as though, like, our only involvement was for the sake of our offspring. Um, I think that that's a really interesting, like, we still need LPA, but also, um, this idea that our kids wouldn't need LPA. I think our kids need LPA as much as any other kids. They have an experience of having dwarfism in their life that they need support with, right? So I think that that aspect is interesting. As far as um, do we know, I think we come from this with a, a interesting perspective and I'll have Jill add to it, but I don't think that we come at our kids with we know the most about their bodies. Um, I think we don't. I mean, I don't know. I don't have a clue what it's like to be average size. Um, I, I um, am really, I mean, we're at almost four and almost two. So, I mean, we're early in the game, but I think our, our take on it is for them to explore what their bodies can do and what their Look bodies up at the can do. And, um, and let them figure that out on their own. Do you want to add something, Joe? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that, that um, that's uh, exactly sort of what our, what our approach has been. Um, I think that it's interesting, you know, we talk a lot in terms of uh, role models and identity formation within LPA and how it's so important to have, um, you know, dwarf role models if you are a, uh, a child with dwarfism and so on and so forth. And I think that's very true. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, one thing that I've thought a lot about um, is how important it's going to be for our kids to have um, 
dwarf role models, <laughs> even though they're not little people, right? Um, so that, it, like, like you say, so that we, way we normalize difference, right? Uh, where they, you know, they see, um, you know, other people that have bodies like ours and uh, are, are, you know, because they don't see that every day when they go to school and so on and so forth. Um, you know, two of our, our good friends have, have um, dwarfism and came over for New Year's Eve this last year. And uh, it made a huge impression on Hazel, especially our, our daughter, who's almost four. And she's constantly talking about these two friends now, uh, where she doesn't really talk about our other friends all that much. <laughs> um, and, I, and I think it has everything to do with the fact that they look like us. And so, you know, that was just so important for her to see that we aren't the only people in the world that have this experience. I mean, I think our our overall overall goal is to like introduce them to as much uh, diversity as possible. Um, but yeah, when you have another question, or when you have your hand up, or virtual hand, do you want to speak? No? Yeah, I was just uh, one. I wanted to make the comment that I think that that people. One reason why people might have been saying that to you, Leah, about why are you still coming was was actually more about you and Joe met each other. So what other reason would you want to come to conventions? You know, like you you found your person, and isn't that really what it's about? You know, so. aren't you down here? <laughs> What's that? Yeah, go dwarf, ahead. Dwarf mating season is over for us. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> why? Why pay all the money? But. Um, <laughs> But as then, then, then I was also just also going to agree as also being a parent of an average size kid, like, you know, I remember um, other friends, you know, coming over when it had been a while since I had taken him to an event. And when um, a couple of another family who were both parents or dwarves came over and he was like, uh, and I was like, okay, we need to go back. Like we need to, to, you know, there's a certain rotation that needs to keep current, you know, and so I was like, all right, clearly I've let it go too long. If this is of note, you know, I think that's the part too. But um, yeah, I think also in thinking about, you know, why, I'm sorry, I'm really tired. I'm a little all over the place, but um, why, you know, would you want to continue? There's also that sort of generational gap I think about too, where I know when I first started quite a long time ago, there weren't a lot of um, uh, dwarf parents having dwarf kids. It was, it was much more average sized kids and sometimes kids got adopted and things like that. But with the higher prevalence of, of dwarf parents having dwarf babies or just babies in general, like I think that that has shifted the sort of focus of the organization in a way that you were talking about earlier, Joe, in terms of the amalgam of the, the you know, when there's, when there's sort of a shift between, you know, our onset of our disability being a mutation or for a lot of forms of dwarfism, not everyone, but a lot of them being a mutation and sort of happening spontaneously versus happening genetically deliberately by choice you know, although I wasn't lucky enough to have that mutation happen for mine, you know, but that's more of a joke than anything else. But I think that's a shift as well, you know, when in terms of identity, when you're not the only one in the family, you know, because pretty much all of my friends as teenagers, like there was one one person who also had a sibling and the geneticists were really interesting that that mutation had happened twice. They were really interested in, in them. But, you know, that's different. It's a whole different set of identity. And so I think the, the question around identity has really shifted a lot um, in ways that weren't true, you know, 20 years ago. So that's my rambling. Oh, yeah. Um... Another person raised their hand, Alan. Did you want to speak on that or speak on something else? Hi. Um, so, I, just to speak about 
Um, what Leah and Joe mentioned about um, the average height parents uh, and LPA and how we all work together. Um, that's, I think, the reason why I keep pushing in as much as possible to have everybody understand. I know that there's this division within LPA. There is a division between um, so many divisions within the organization. There are the parents of the, the average height parents and then the, the dwarf parents. And then there are the dwarf parents that had uh, biological children and then the dwarf parents that had uh, adopted children. Then there are the parents that had, um, that chose not to have kids. Then the parents that have average height children and it just goes on and on and on. Um, so I think, and I mentioned this in another chat earlier today, is that we need to be mindful of our space and to continue uh, bringing people together. It is, I always bring up this analogy and, and Rachel's probably gonna laugh again, but I call it like the big Filipino family uh, theory is that we at all, there, there's like 90 of us, we all can't get along, we're all not best friends. It's just gonna happen. Um, so you will find that in LPA as well. We talk about the clicks that happen, and yes, there are clicks. And yes, but you need to keep pushing on to find that one person. Maybe it's just one. Maybe it's just maybe it's three of you that you find a connection with. And maybe that person, maybe you're an LP, but you find a connection with an average height sibling, something like that. But anything that will keep you connected to the organization is what you should continue striving for to bring together the community. Um, it's, it's really hard to find a space for yourself. It's really hard to, to find that comfort. Um, but we all have to continue. I think that's like what Joe said. It's like the beauty of the organization, but as well as uh, the difficulty of the organization is, is that there are so many subgroups within it. So we just need to be mindful of what what we want for the organization and ourselves and to not uh, break it because we there's a reason why we're here as LPs that was our average height of the, uh, parents uh, and if you're our second third fourth generation LP there is somewhere down the line you came from an average height parent so you know that's um, that's all I had to say to contribute. Uh, yeah, um, it's a good, great point. I am wondering if anybody here on this chat listening in who's average height has any questions um, for us that we could try to talk about. Um, I mean, a question, not necessarily how tall are you, but uh, other questions. Does anybody have anything you want to, or, or an example that you've had in your own life that uh, maybe we could discuss. It doesn't have to necessarily do with being little or being disabled or, um, yeah, I'd like, because I would like to, because I'd be mindful that a lot of people here aren't little, but they haven't said anything. So I'd like to give them the chance to speak. So. I see your hand, Gail. Go ahead. Hi, I know some of the people on this call. So um, I'm actually Ian's mom. And I haven't, <laughs> so I haven't been, at, we haven't been at LPA, uh, Ian's family hasn't since he's been an adult going on his own. But I have to say we miss all the people that we've gotten to be friends with and both the uh, little people and their uh, little people, their, if they had a, a fa whole family of little people or if they had average statured family and they were the only little people, we miss seeing all of you and all of them. So it's fun to see a few of you on this uh, call tonight. And I just, I shared this a couple of years ago with uh, Jenny Foos, who the LPA members will know, that um, we were so relieved and so thankful at LPA to, have all the little people 
adults for, I hope we don't embarrass Ian because he's an adult now, but when he was a child, for him to have the role models of all the accomplished and poised and uh, professional, uh, friendly, outgoing, talented adults to look up to who were little people as he was. And it was, that was for us one of the best or the greatest um, benefits of going to LPA beyond making our, all of our family friendships was just for him to have those role models. So um, I'm always a little taken aback to hear that about any kind of um, conflict between the parents, but uh, experienced. there always is, uh, in any group, there's gonna be you know, varying opinions and experiences. And, but we were always grateful for the uh, LP parents that we met through the years. I will add that, that uh, I think it was San Diego in uh, six years ago now, where I, I first saw this, when, when you've grown up in LPA and all of a sudden some kid's mom takes you aside and says, here's 20 bucks, take my kid out and get pizza and like talk to them about high school and girls, it's a very weird experience to suddenly shift from being the kid to, hey, I, I want you to be a role model, please go do that, very weird. Nobody's done that to me. I want the 20 bucks. I'll take the kid out for pizza. <laughs> Get the word. Time, it'll happen. It'll definitely happen. I'll give you 20 bucks to take Hazel off my hands anytime you want. <laughs> no, oh, I love that. She's a, she's a stand-up comedian. I'll, I love that. I'd laugh all day with her. Um, I, I did want to say something really quick um, to uh, Ian's mom, Gail. Um, Ms. Smith, I don't know what I should call you. Hi. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, I, I wanted to um, uh, sort of talk about this idea of role models. And I think that um, looking back on my sort of uh, involvement in the organization, it's almost as if uh, my parents are average height as well um, as context, but it's almost as if my, my parents needed role models in a way um, as much as I did. Um, you know, my, my first uh, national, I lied before I said my first national was in my early 20s. That was actually my second national. Um, my first national was uh, when I was like five years old. I barely remember it. Um, but uh, it was on the East Coast and I grew up on the East Coast. And so my whole family went. And uh, there we met Lee Kitchens, who some of you might know of or know personally. Um, he was sort of one of the, the founding fathers of LPA, um, and he was an engineer, and my father was an engineer, and so they hit it off, like, immediately, um, and I think that that was a really um, fruitful relationship for my father to have, because he was able to uh, identify with uh, an adult with dwarfism, um, and I think that that probably helped him imagine a future for me um as as his son um oh, exactly yeah i felt that too joe yeah. when i saw people uh when i met adult lps that's how i felt too just like oh wow this is gonna happen for my kid too you know yeah. exactly and so it's almost as if the the role modeling happens for for the kid but also for the for the parent mm -hmm. And I'd just like to say some of my biggest role models in LPA are some of the people on this call who have been, you know, kind of a few, just a few years older than me um, and just have seen them go to college, get married, become parents before me. Um, I think that's something at, at every stage of life, you know, when you, you live in an average height world, just being able to see people like you taking that next step. Um, I've said that several times of, um, you know, I think a lot of times we talk about needing LPA or needing LP role models as a kid or as a teenager, but it never stops. I mean, even at 39 years old, I still need someone a few steps ahead of me to tell me what's coming and how to deal with it and how to process it and how to think about it. And yeah, it never, it never ends. We'll take you out to pizza the next time we're together. We can <laughs> talk about school. And... I'll go with you guys. Yeah. Do it. Do it.
<laughs> Other question? I had a kind of a, another uh, sideways comment on the role model thing is uh, when I first started going to LPA, I had a kind of a similar but in reverse intimidation where I saw all these people that seemed like they were kind of handling it much better than I was. It seemed, I mean, and this is just an impression because of course I know my insides much better, you know, I'm judging my insides by somebody's outsides. So I saw all these people who seemed to be well acculturated and assimilated and kind of like their mental health seemed to be okay and, you know, and so on. And it really made me feel awkward because I felt, oh, these people all seem to have it, a handle on it and I don't, you know? And of course that was just, you know, an impression that I had that was about my myself really more than them. And it took me a while of coming coming around to figure out that that wasn't exactly the case, <laughs> you know? Um, but I did take it in, in a negative way. Uh, you know, those same kind of role models. I was like, they, they're the ones who have it all together. Why don't I have it together? I'm, you know, and, uh, you know, of course it has to do with your viewpoint of who you're looking at, of your perspective, you know, and, uh, and also the irony was that I had to keep coming back to find my people, to find the people that I wanted, that were like me, that were, you know, my kind of people that I would hang out with, even if I wasn't at the convention. But I think what happens is people, and this kind of touches on something else I, I wanted to bring up is that people will come to a convention and it's the first time they've ever been around people that are like them in their lives. And it's the first time they've ever seen any, like really been in contact with a group of people that are like them that look, so their first time they're looking at people that look like them when they see like, that's what I look like from the back. That's what my butt looks like, you know? And, and we don't always act very well to each other. So what can happen is this big opportunity that cannot always, doesn't always reveal itself at first. People have such a horrible time socializing with us for various reasons that they will never come back. I've had people, multiple, actually women, tell me that they'll never come back to a convention because of how horribly people treated them. Not, not because of you. Not because of me, obviously, but, <laughs> um, but, but my concern is that the convention is such a high cost of financially and so on, and it can sometimes not reveal itself as its benefit right away, that people will just give, get, get a bad impression at first and just never come back and then not really be with us, you know? And I don't know what to do about them. Like, how do you, this is kind of a way <laughs> tangent, but like, you know, they never come back and how do you find them again, you know? Yeah, that's a, that's a big concern. I mean, you know, like I run these other conferences, more here conference, not every year. And it's so new that people with more here like, well, why you run this? What's the difference between that and going to LPA or another organization called MPS? And I try to explain to them how this is like, it's just more about you with more heal. Think of LPA more about your whole social fun, even though it's not all fun and party, but there's a lot more of that happening. And NPS is, well, I'm not gonna talk about that. But anyway, there is, there's a difference, and they're like, but it costs so much money, or I did all the way down. I'm like, they're like, when are you going to move to California? I'm like, I can't. I don't have the money to move it around the whole country. LPA's all, always been done in hotels, but this thing has to, unfortunately, be done close to the hospital, because otherwise, I got to pay all these freaking doctors to come. And guess what? None of them are going to travel for free, and there's no money in work here and, at all. So it's a... Uh, it's a concern. So you get people that come, they say, oh, I'm going to come again. And they go, I don't have money. And then they're not willing to ask for it. Even though you say, there is some money to help you just let us know. Cause I'm not going to be the one to go out to them and be like, I know you don't really have money. So here it is. No, <laughs> cause I don't want to give money away just because I assume they don't have it. And so it's hard for, and then there are some people who say, well, I've never been to any of these types of events. I'm doing just fine at home. And it's true, they may be. And I think we have to sort of allow that 
person to come or not come. Um, but then there are also their siblings who both people have worked here and one come and they go, they can't get their other sibling to come. It's never gone to LPA, it's never gone to a work here thing. But the one sibling's like, I keep trying to convince my sister to come and he, she refuses. And so there's a riff even within that one little family of whether or not to come to these conferences. And it is costly, I mean, costs a lot. I mean, I used to go a lot more to LPA nationals when I lived on the mainland, but now that I live in Hawaii, it's like, do I really want to travel to some other random state? Or do I want to travel and see family on the East Coast? So LPA's conferences have sort of been, I haven't spent my money as much there, but I, and then I went again for the first time in a few years and I was like, oh my God, what am I doing not going? I need to come back more often. So it comes and goes. But. Um, we're actually over time already, so anyone want to add one last tidbit or whatever? I want to say thank you for uh, organizing this, Maria. Um, this has been uh, a lot of fun for us, and uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping Ian feels the same. I, I don't think I insulted him too badly today. Um, <laughs> but, we, should, we should do that, Joe. Let's, let's get together and let's, let's do a roast sometime. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Um, so yeah, no, I mean, I had a, I had a great time and, uh, thank you so much for all the work that went into, uh, organizing, uh, this, this event. I know that you put a lot into it and it shows and, uh, um, Ruben as well. Thank you. I, I know I received a couple of emails from you. Um, thank you for the work that you put into this as well. Well, thank you. For, thank you for appearing on here and coming and bringing your expertise. I mean, you brought a lot of great points, so. Thanks. Yeah. You too, Leah and Ian, and everyone else that talked. It was really helpful. It was a fun, fun yeah. conversation. Absolutely. It was great.